And what's so interesting is, um, you know, you guys ever ever go on like prophetic journeys with God? Like just like where it just seems like stories are unraveling over time. And, and I personally love that. I love prophetic words. But the greater thing, I, one of the things I love even more is prophetic adventures and like prophetic storylines with God where like one thing leads to another thing that leads to another thing that really unravels to a big picture of what he's doing. And um, what's, what's really, uh, what's so interesting is, is uh, our, uh, our church is about 30 minutes away from the location that in um, 1903, the first evidence of speaking in tongues in America was heard. And, um, and it was in a, a place called Shiloh, uh, which was the largest school of ministry in the world. They had 500 students um, in 1903, and they had day and night worship and prayer that had been lasting, unending for 24 years. And, uh, what, what, and, then, and these guys, they bought a boat, right? And I, I love wild faith because these guys buy a boat and they put a bunch of people on the boat and they circumnavigated the world with a boat house of prayer. And they prayed and fasted for all the nations of the earth and they saw the dead raised and in one night, and what, here's one of the funny things, they had 24 hour worship and prayer, but they had three prayer towers and two of, um, and, and, uh, and what they were, where they were like set, the, one was for kids, one was for women, and one was for men. And they had all these prayer towers, and they were hosting 24 hours in all three turrets for 24 years. And, uh, and in one night in the, in the women's uh, tower, believe it or not, the women's tower, uh, one of the ladies busted out in tongues. And uh, no one knew what it was, but she began to utter things, and... and um, and a man by the name of Charles Parham, has anybody ever heard of Charles Parham? Yes. Charles Parham in Topeka, Kansas, heard about these people in Maine that were, were speaking in tongues, and it began to break out all over this community, and he took a train and came up to Maine, and the story is, is that in the middle of the night when he arrived, he was climbing the stairs to the seventh floor of the tower where they prayed, and, uh, and on his way, the Holy Spirit came upon him, he fell and began to speak in tongues. And he returned back to Topeka, and this thing began to happen. This is simultaneously to something happening in, um, in Wales as the Welsh revival was happening. And then uh, a man by the name of William Seymour and, um, and, Charles, and uh, William Seymour and Frank Bartleman joined together for what would be called Azusa Street. And Azusa Street um, has uh, the outpouring, the Azusa Street revival has now led to what is estimated of 500 million believers that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit since Azusa Street. And um, in this great move of God of, of white and black and old and young, um, the stories and the scenes of children praying for people with missing limbs and them growing back. There's stories of of gold dust appearing that they'd have to sweep into trash bags off the floor. And guys, there was, there was no internet where we heard stories about this. You know what I mean? These are documented now through our history and, and black people and white people coming together, embracing and weeping at the altar at a time where it just didn't happen. Everything was segregated. And God began to do something significant in that day. And there was a family in Maine that heard about the Azusa Street revival and they went and they, and they moved to Los Angeles were touched by it, and they came and they planted a church in Oakland, Maine, and that's now the church I pastor. And um, a hundred, over a hundred year little prophetic storyline that's unraveling, and God is doing an amazing thing in our church community. And, and uh, I planted it when I was 18, and, and uh, out of a move of God in my high school where I didn't know any of this history, but God began to reawaken the DNA of a place. And, um, and marked a group of people, and, and we've had the greatest privilege of calling that home and then exporting what God is doing in this little community around the world. And, and, um, and this place has a very special place in my heart. And uh, how many of you guys were there during the extended meetings um, of, of the outpouring? Um, that's awesome. Uh, for, some, for some of you guys, are, uh, sorry that you're going to hear so many stories. I'm going to treat you like you all missed out, but... You didn't miss out. How many guys know greater things are coming? And, um, and you are here for such a time as this. And, and um, I had a dream um, in February of that year where the outpouring happened. What year was that? 2012. So five years. I thought it was five years ago. Okay. In February 2012, I had a dream. And in the dream, um, I was sitting with my friend Georgian Banoff on a porch. Does anyone know Georgian? He's a... He is a hilarious gentleman. And, um, 
and he's a traveling minister, and um, he wrote the song Bullfrogs and Butterflies, but now he's just totally out of his mind in love with Jesus and taking things around the world, and, and um, I was sitting with him in this dream. I was sitting with him on my porch, and we were, I, I don't have a porch, but we were sitting on my porch, and we were rocking back and forth and, and looking at the backyard, and George and sitting there, we're laughing and talking in this dream, and then he goes, hey, look. In my, in my backyard, a hole opened up in the ground. And he goes, Jamie, let's go fishing. I was like, what? And we get off my porch and we run, and there was a river running under the ground um, in, in, in this like well that had been created suddenly in a moment. And uh, we ran and we put in our fishing lines and we began to go fishing under this underground current. And it just so happens that um, I had Georgian lined up to speak on Mother's Day that year um, in a couple months to come and speak at my church. And so I called uh, my spiritual dad, Brian Simmons, and I called him up and I said, Pops, you won't believe it, but I had this dream. Revival is going to happen in Maine on Mother's Day. I had this dream. And he goes, Jamie, that's amazing. I believe it. Like, come on now. And, uh, and, and, and so he was in agreement where like we were waiting for it and like because Georgian and, and it just it all made sense. Revival was going to pop. This well of revival was going to reopen on Mother's Day. And, uh, and Mother's Day happens and I'm, I'm waiting for it and they were it was good. It's a good day, but it was not revival, you know. And I honestly went to bed that night a little dis- disappointed and I woke up first thing in the morning with a phone call from Brian Simmons the next day and he goes, Jamie. Revival started on Mother's Day. I said, no, it didn't, man. I'm so sorry. I was wrong. I don't know what the dream means. You know, like I was, I don't believe in the prophetic. And no, I'm just going to add and say that. But uh, I, was, I was like discouraged in a little bit. And he's like, no, you won't believe it. And Greenwich, Connecticut, being to tell me the story of God showing up here. And I went, oh, my backyard of New England that a well of revival was about to open up and, uh, and that I was to get off my porch and to come and go fishing uh, in the well that just opened up. And, um, and it was an honor that we got to leave our porch and to come and pioneer the guys. And I, I love moves of God such as the one that happened because they're like catalysts, you know, and, and things get birthed uh, in those movements of time where um, where a revelation will come to the church and the church will be provoked to be activated in the revelation the Holy Spirit's revealing to the church. And as the church begins to get activated, it starts a movement of activity based upon the revelation of what God was doing in that time. And, and, uh, and I, I believe that there are many things that if we tracked it back in New England were birthed at that moment and that hour for New England and for the whole Hudson Valley. And, uh, and I believe things were catalyzed in that moment and we can oftentimes go like wow like man like it stopped and you know we could ask all kinds of questions but the point is not did the meetings begin or end it's what was catalyzed and birthed in a region that the people are now mobilizing with with their call and their mission from that season that they're in and um and I want to I want to share some stuff with you guys tonight are you ready Since I was last here, I had two babies. Amen. Things were catalyzed. <laughs> My wife and I just moved. We just finished renovating a house in Maine. We, we bought our first home. And um, we bought a fixer-upper. So you can just call me Chip Gaines if you'd like. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, um, I, I did it all myself and while we were traveling, doing ministry, and renovated a home and and it's been a crazy season. We have been traveling more than we ever have with our babies. And um, we're having to say no more than we ever have just to keep doing what we're doing in Maine. And um, how many of you guys know God's doing some pretty cr- incredible things around the earth? Amen. Oh, man, it's a good day to be alive. Um, do you know right now in Indonesia, a Muslim is being saved every seven seconds? Isn't that crazy? In, the, um, in, in uh, China right now, they're in a major political turmoil in China because, um, not sure uh, how like, known this is, but communism is being challenged in China right now. 
because um, the majority of the population of China now are believers. Fastest growing church in the history of the world. And, um, <clears throat> but India right now is equally like challenging China for the, the status of fastest growing church in the history of the world. 10,000 people a week are being saved in Indonesia. And, and um, there are places right now, just keep an eye on this, there's places right now that are being to experience those waves of revival from India and China. There are nations that are being touched right now that are the only nations that North Koreans are allowed to travel to. And so just be prepared that the gospel will find its way to every crevice of the earth. Amen. And, uh, and so it's, it's a, the dead is, are being raised. The, there's never been more unified worship and prayer in the history of the world. Um, I, I've been privileged to be a part of helping plant a house of prayer in Mosul, northern Iraq. Um, the war-torn city of Mosul that ISIS was just booted from. There's now a house of prayer in the heart of the city in the rubble. Um, in uh, northern Iraq, we have, we have teams from our burn team that are right in the refugee camps where they are being literally these, these single blonde pretty girls that are like with their skinny jeans and their designer jackets are grabbing their guitars and these Muslim soldiers are bringing them to the front lines of the war of ISIS where they're looking at ISIS a mile away and they're bringing these girls with guitars and these uh, these these burners, you know, these wild, crazy ones that put themselves there and they're bringing them to the front lines in Iraq uh, because the Muslims are starting to recognize, the Muslim soldiers are fighting for the independence are, are identifying that, that they win battles against ISIS when the Christians bring their guitars. And, uh, and so, how many of you guys know it's a good day to be alive? I don't care what CNN's telling you. It's a good day to be alive. If you guys have your Bibles, go with me to, um, go with me to, uh, where are we going to go? Amos 9-11. Go with me to Amos 9-11. Figure out where I'm going to start here tonight. I want to be quick with you. I know we're, we're doing a Wednesday night service. I'm going to try to run through some stuff with you. Because um, here's what I believe. I, I want more outpourings in the church. And I want to see great moves of the Holy Spirit among us. Um, but I also, I, I believe that the Lord is bringing us into, us into a season of movements that will never end. Um, uh, revelations that will never die out. Um, activity in the church that brings the believer into absolute dominion authority um, into every sphere of, of um, every sphere of society and every nation of the earth. I believe that we are being trained and equipped right now to understand who we are and who Christ in us would be the hope that God would receive glory, you know, and, and that we would truly have a revelation and understanding of our sonship, who we are, and the call to complete and utter dominion um, over every living thing in every nation of the earth. And, um, and, and, and I believe that he's revealing that to us, and it's not just a revelation of faith and not just a revelation of identity, but also about the divine order of God. And, uh, and I want to talk about divine order that attracts divine influence. And uh, I want to look real quick at Amos 11. This is a, a messianic prophecy that is still um, being fulfilled. Amos 11 says, And in that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. All the Gentiles were called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. And behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes to him who sows seed. And the mountains will drip with wine and the hills will flow from it. And I will bring back the captives, my people, to Israel. And, uh, and we know that this passage was mentioned again in Acts 15 in the presence of the Gentile church saying, don't you understand that the Gentiles being saved is this prophecy relating back to Amos 9-11. But we understand that although that those days were a moment of fulfillment, it was not the complete fulfillment um, uh, for the Christian church. And it says that and in that day, speaking of the days of Jesus, I will repair the fallen tent of David I will repair the place that's fallen down, and then 
I will bring to myself all the remnants of mankind. I will bring the Gentile and the Jew back together. and I will bring them all to me. We're talking about an end times global harvest of souls that began at the resurrection of Christ and has not completed but is only accelerating. And uh, we, there are more being saved every day across the world right now than the days of the apostles. And, uh, and it's, that, that is an ex- something to be very excited about. Uh, I, was, I was just this past weekend, I was in San Francisco on Hippie Hill. And uh, any, any Summer of Love people in the room? This is your 50 year anniversary. Summer of Love this summer. And, um, and we, were, we were just uh, on Hippie Hill in San Francisco, one of the most godless places I've ever been. And um, which I, you'll find out about me pretty quickly. Those are my favorite places to be. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we, we were, we were with 1200 believers worshiping through Golden Gate Park. And I'm not kidding you, um, street thugs and home, you know, and, and people that choose to live homeless hippies. Um, they, these guys were, were begging for the gospel as we were singing and worshiping Jesus and, the, and just covering the park one of the hardest places I've ever ministered in the presence of worship, they were begging to be saved. We literally could not get to our houses that we were walking to across the city without people coming to us asking to be saved. Um, and, uh, and, and this gospel is only accelerating. And in this passage, it says, and I will repair the fallen tent of David. And I'm a very practical person. And uh, when it says I'm going to repair David's fallen tent, how many guys know that David's tent wasn't the only tent? <laughs> and I, I, I find myself asking, well, why David's tent? I'm a practical person, right? I, I look and go, there's some pretty awesome tents in the Bible. There was um, Moses' tent of meeting. Do you guys remember that one? Set up a tent, pillar of cloud come down on the tent. And, uh, and, and Moses would walk and speak to God face to face and the glory would come down and, and Joshua would get locked in on the presence of God and couldn't get up. And you guys remember that tent? It's a good tent. Why did he repair it, not repair that tent? And uh, there, there's, uh, how about the, the, the tabernacle of, of uh, Solomon? Do you guys remember that one? All the priests without division coming together, singing uh, the song of the three Jews. You are good and your love endures forever. And fire comes and strikes the altar. To this day, the Jews are wailing against the wall to point it at the location of that encounter, longing for the return of their Messiah. You know, the Muslims are fighting over that holy ground, believing that that's the place where Muhammad will will strike his feet on that hill. And the nations are warring over that location. Why not the why not Solomon's temple? Why wouldn't he resurrect? That one's a pretty awesome one. And I, 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 I asked this question when I was reading this one that we're all, the scripture we're all talking about. Amos 9, 11 is repeated again in Acts 15. I asked myself, why the 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 why the tent of David, I mean, let's not forget this dude had an affair and murdered a guy, right? And uh, I was looking at it, and, and, I, and I went back to the story of David, and I began to look at it, and, uh, and if you guys want, go with me to 2 Samuel 6. I'm going to go through it quick, just for time's sake. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 6, you guys know the story of David, so I won't go into it, but when David, when, when, um, when Saul has fallen on his sword and died in battle and David is anointed king, David does go on a war path. And David, seeing that the nation was divided as Judah and Israel and the capital of Israel being Shiloh, he said, this isn't right. We've got to restore the nation again. And he began to go on a war path to begin to prepare a place because he knew that the Ark of the Covenant, the glory of God, had to return to a whole place. And it had to be put back on Mount Zion, which was not under their rulership. And so he went on a war path to begin to begin to build the perimeters of a place where God could dwell. And after he took, after he took Zion and he restored the nation as one, it says that then David immediately went after his first priority, which was to get the Ark of the Covenant back to Mount Zion. And uh, one of the things you have to understand is that the Ark of the Covenant had been missing 
from its proper place of ministry for 97 years. If you guys don't remember the story that it was at Shiloh under Eli and Eli was ministering to the Ark of the Covenant and they could not go to battle with the Philistines because they kept losing. And they go, we can't beat them. They have iron and we have sticks. How do we do this? And somebody had the bright idea, well, let's get the Ark of the Covenant and let's drop it like a bomb on the Philistines, right? And so they went to Eli and Eli is like, well, do what you got to do. But, you know, but, but Eli went to the outer courts of, and waited as they brought the Ark of the Covenant out and all of Israel began to, row. they're going to win, you know. And they're all excited and cheering. It says, in, it says in the scripture that the Philistines heard the cheering and the chanting of Israel and fear came on them because they knew that the God of the Jews was coming. And it says that they were tremoring in fear. And here Israel walks it out and places it down. And they begin to go to battle. And it, and it literally says, and that the, it, the, it no longer became a Jew against Philistine. It began to become a fight for the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that the Philistines fought for the Ark harder than Israel did. And they lost the battle. And the Ark of the Covenant was captured and it says that a messenger came to tell Eli, and Eli was so overcome that he fell over backwards, he hit his head, and he died. And, um, and, and so we know this story. Well, the Ark of the Covenant, and I have to tell this part to understand where we're going with David because it matters. So the Ark of the Covenant gets in the hands of the Philistines, and they bring it back. They bring it back to their camp, and they go, well, we didn't expect this today, Right? Like, we did not expect to come out of this alive, and now, not only alive, we have the Ark of the Covenant. And because you imagine they're having a huddle, and they're going, well, what do we do? What do we do with the Ark of the Covenant right now? And, and they go, well, it's a God, right? Like, right? And like, well, well, how do we, you know, how, how, where do we put it? Like, well, we built, we spent, like, a lot of money, and we built this, like, thing for Dagon. I bet you they would get along great. And they, they put the Ark of the Covenant right in with Dagon. And they're like, we built this. Let's put him here, right? What do you guys know the story, right? They wake up and there's, where's Dagon? Bowing before the Ark of the Covenant, face first. And they're like, oh, that's a, oh well, we'll just put him back into place. And they put him back in. They come back the next day. Where's Dagon? Bowing before. Our God does not play nice to other gods, right? Exodus 34, I will have no other gods before me. I am a jealous God. And so here's Dagon bowing for him. Now his head's popped off, his arms are popped off, and fear comes on the Philistines. Like, oh man, what do we do? And so they're like, we gotta get rid of this thing. And they go, well, how do we get rid of them? And they go, well, we put our gods on, on these carts. Let's just grab one of the carts, those golden ones. Let's get one of those golden carts. Let's put the Ark of the Covenant on it. And we'll just send some oxen in that way. And wherever it goes, it goes, right? And so they smack the oxen. They go, go. And it gets to the next town. And the Philistines are like, Look at what the gods have brought us. They've brought us the gods of the Jews, right? And they're like, woo. And they bring it in and they go to bed that night all excited that the gods have brought them the god of the Jews. And what happens? They, they, the hemorrhoids <laughs> breaks out over the entire city. I'm not kidding you. It's hilarious. You can laugh at that. Hemorrhoids breaks out over the entire community. And they go, it's not a blessing. This is a curse. And they... They go, well, how'd it come? It came on a cart. And they slap the oxen. They go, get out of here. And then the oxen wander back into Israel. And the first place it lands is a place called Kirjath Jerim. And it lands there. And, and uh, in, the, in the shaking up of the high priest to the judge role, there, there was no place for the Ark of the Covenant to be ministered to. And they take it in and they, they hold the Ark of the Covenant for 97 years. They had no idea what they were doing. They had no instruction or guidance or leadership, but they contained the Ark of the Presence for 97 years. Saul becomes king. He pays no attention to it. No transition happens in any of the leadership, but it remains there until David is anointed king. And David, after 97 years, do you understand that that's like two generations have gone by? We're talking about like, like folklore at this point. And, and after a hundred years have gone by, David goes, we've got to get the Ark of the Covenant. 
back to Mount Zion. He makes place for it. They, they put the capital on Mount Zion again. And then he goes, guys, I shed all that blood for this day. Let us go and get the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that they take 30,000 choice soldiers. And you guys understand, there's no battle to be won. This is on their territory. And they array themselves like a parade. And they invite all of Israel to come with them. And they are marching to Kirjath Jerim. I don't even know, 30,000 soldiers and then thousands of people from Israel. And then they're inviting Kirjath Jerim when they get there, join us. And now we got thousands of people in a parade. Can you imagine the electricity and the excitement? The Ark of the Covenant is going to be ministered to again on Mount Zion. And they're cheering and they're marching proudly and David is leading them the greatest day and, and, and they come up to this dude's house, right? And this guy was a farmer and he had a threshing floor. A threshing floor was the place where the wheat and the tares were separated. It, in every place of scripture, it's prophetically seen as the, as the separation of, of godliness and, and, and ungodliness. It's the place of shaking, you know, and and, and, they, and, and, and now mind you, how were they transporting the Ark of the Covenant? David got to Kirjath Jerim and he says, hey, um, how do we move it? And they go, oh. It's like, it, it came on a cart. We still have it in storage. I don't know if it'll hold it. It might have run, but you want, it, you want that? And they put it back on the cart that it arrived on. And they start marching and they come up. They're about two miles away from home. And... Uh, and, and they're, they're nearing, they're in the valley, getting ready to go back up Mount Zion. And they come up on this threshing floor and they're leading them over the threshing floor. As they go over the threshing floor, the oxen begin to stumble. And uh, as the oxen begin to stumble, the, the, the ark begins to go like this on the cart. And as it begins to waver back and forth, um, it, now mind you, I, I'm, like I said, I'm kind, of, I'm kind of practical when I read the Bible. And uh, I read it and there's this guy named Uzzah. Dude, that dude got a bad deal, right? Listen, this may be the worst deal in the Bible, right? Like, I feel awful every time I read about Uzzah because this guy has been, like, faithful to, like, do his best mission the Ark of the Covenant. He's now walking alongside and bringing this thing. And the Ark of the Covenant's about to fall over and the contents are going to spill out on the ground. God's about to be disgraced in front of thousands of people. And Uzzah goes, not on my watch, and he stabilizes the Ark of the Covenant and pff, lightning strikes him because he's not supposed to touch it. I'm like, dude, that poor guy. I know he's with the Lord, but man, what a bad deal, right? Like, I would have done the same thing. And, and I, I look on that story and, I, and you, know, you have to realize is that the, the, the problem did not begin with Uzzah touching the Ark of the Covenant, this relates back to the way that the Ark of the Covenant was being carried. Because the Ark of the Covenant was never meant to be carried on man-made structures and prototypes. It was always meant to be carried upon the shoulders of the priests. You know, and, and this is so important for us to understand. It's so easy for us to look to objects, models, and different things that we do as believers and begin to create formulas that we put glory on. You know, like the glory is not Sunday morning, 10 a.m. in a building. You know what I mean? Like the glory is not on that way that you prayed that one time and someone got healed. The glory is not on that one worship song that, that now works every time we play. You guys, you guys hear what I'm saying? Like the glory of God is carried upon the shoulders of the priests. It, you are the carriers of the presence of God. I, there is not... There is not a structure in the world that, has, uh, that, that carries power on it, only the people that are carrying it. And, uh, and that we, we struggle over models of prayer and models of mission and models of evangelism. And I have seen God do greater things with sillier models uh, all over the world that I had no faith and thought didn't make sense. Prayers that didn't even point to the need but were just weird and random, but God still did it. Literally in these meetings, I prayed for a lady for her shoulder to get healed and her, and her stomach got healed. You, you guys hear what I'm saying? Like, how many of you guys know that the glory is not upon the structure of the prototype? It's on you. And, uh, and so David stops in that moment. Everyone's witnessed this moment. And David goes, well, maybe we should rethink this. 
And, uh, and someone goes, hey, I know this guy. He lives around the corner. His name is Obed-Edom. He's a great guy. I know he'd let us park the Lord in his barn and, uh, <laughs> while we go figure this out. And, and so he's like, great, let's do that. Everyone goes home. The Ark of the Covenant goes in his house. And uh, Obed-Edom, you guys realize that like, money just wasn't showing up on trees, but, but literally what it means that Obed-Edom's house became blessed means that all of his cows got pregnant. All of his daughters got pregnant. Everything that he put his hands to was multiplying, and the house of Obed-Edom was blessed. And word gets back to David, and David goes, okay, I'll, we got to get it to the heart of a nation again. And, uh, and so he goes to... He goes back to get it. He brings the whole army. He causes the parade. He's got it figured out. We got to get that acacia wood. We got to carry this on our shoulders right now. And, uh, and they go and they get the Ark of the Covenant. But this time he does something a little bit extra. And this time he goes before the army and he goes before the nation and he goes before the Ark of the Covenant and he, and he takes six steps and then he slaughters a, um, a, a sheep and an oxen. And he offers it to the Lord and worships the Lord. And he takes six steps and he sacrifices the sheep and oxen and he offers it to the Lord. Do you guys realize that that's a lot of sheep and oxen if you're walking two miles? Every six step, offering it to the Lord. And, and not only that, but did you guys know that Mount Zion is a mountain? <laughs> Revelation with Jamie tonight. Mount Zion is a mountain. Guess where they are? They're in the valley. And there's a whole nation behind them. I did, I did a little math. Let me see if I can find it. I, I pulled it up because um, I, I, I don't want to. Let, let me. Uh, let me share. Okay. I just want to be. I want to make sure. Okay. We're 3.5 miles from Obed Edom's house to. Uh, to Mount Zion. If you take six paces for 3.5 miles, that's 3,500 paces. And if you divide that by six, you're about 585 oxen and 585 sheep. Wow. Now I want you to get a picture of what's happening. As they're going up the mountain and they're sacrificing a sheep and they're sacrificing an oxen, as they're going up the hill, what is beginning to happen? Blood is beginning to roll down Mount Zion. The blood of the lamb and the blood of the oxen are rolling down Mount Zion. Do you understand that they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant and now an entire nation's feet are stained in the blood of the lamb? There's an entire, the priests are covered in the blood of the lamb and the oxen. And, and, they're, and, and they're covered and they're saturated in their feet and their soles of their feet. And there's a river of blood flowing down Mount Zion. And it's recorded that they were singing a song. And the song of the Levites, the song of David was this. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place but those with clean hands and a pure heart. Who have not given them souls over to any other idols. For this is a generation of those who will seek you. Will seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads. Oh, you gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors. For the king of glory will enter in. Who is the king of glory? Strong and mighty, mighty in battle. And, and this is literally like a song of what they're walking out as they're walking in the blood of the lamb going, who may ascend the hill of the Lord with those clean hands and a pure heart? The whole nation is being marked in this moment by the blood of the lamb. And the prophetic man David is walking this out before us. And, and as he's going up the hill, they come to the gates and they, and, and they look like an army that's gone to battle, covered in the blood. And they stand before the watchmen on the walls. They said, lift up the heads of the gates, open them up. And they go, but who's coming in? The king of glory. Right? <clears throat> Who is this king of glory? He's the mighty one, the strong and mighty, mighty in battle. And as they enter in through the gates of the city, they begin to celebrate yeah. the coming of the king into Mount Zion. As they're celebrating the Lord, and as they're lifting a shout, David's kind of getting crazy, right? Yeah. And he, he's kind of getting a little overwhelmed. And, and David is dressed like a king, and he goes, bah! and he takes his, 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 takes his kingly garments, and he's standing in a linen ephod. 
He's not naked. Don't get weird. Dan, David's in a linen ephod. And David, do you know who else wore linen ephods before the presence of the Lord? The priest did, right? And so, so David is the king and the whole nation's watching. And David goes, I'm in the presence of God. I don't want to be a king of men. I want to be a priest in the presence of God. And he begins to dance and he begins to go wild before the Lord. And he's losing his mind. You know what the other crazy thing in this moment is? Is that David's acting as his extravagant heart. But, but here's, the, here's the wild aspect of this is that there's never at this moment in the history of the, of the, of the Jews ever been a recorded dancing king or priest. And, and, and they all only knew of dancing priests were the, were the Baal worshipers. And so when, when Michael, his wife, goes, how dare you? First of all, you denied your greater place of royalty to become a lowly priest before all the eyes of the people. But secondly, you look like a, a gosh darn pagan out there, right? You completely made a fool of yourself. And David looks at her and what does he say? You, lady, are you, you, I'm finished with you. That's right. And uh, he, he says, lady, you have not seen anything yet. I'm going to get so crazy. And I wish it was recorded that moment he got more crazy than this. But David's like, you have not seen anything yet. I think part of me believes that he was prophesying about you. But... Um, uh, you know, he, he says that, and at that moment, her, in, her, in her cynicism, God struck her womb barren. And here's something the Lord told me about this moment. When, when, uh, when, when the, he struck her womb barren, it was out of her cynicism against the zeal of the Lord. I think much of the evangelical church in America has become barren because of their cynicism against the, the zeal of, of the church. And uh, I, I believe that much of, much of the evangelical church has become barren. But here's great news, is that there is a prophetic word in Isaiah 54 that had a pr- promise for the barren woman. And the, the prophetic word was, was this, right? Sing, O barren woman. Sing, O barren woman. For greater will be the children of the barren woman, the woman who's given birth. You're about to increase, stretch out your tent pegs, because your children are about to inhabit desolate cities. And uh, here, here's what I believe about there's barren churches that you and I know that have been around, have been touched by, have been wounded by, have been around and have had a, maybe even been accused by or whatever it might be. But here's the crazy thing is we need to release the, those things to the Lord and, and invite them into the singing. We need to invite the barren church to come and sing with us. Because in that place, you get ready, there are barren churches in this region that we thought we would be the leaders of the next move of God, but they're going to lead us into the next move of God because they're going to join the procession of song that they once were cynical of. And one of the favorite things that I see around the world in movements like the Burn 24-7 is it's a movement of inviting churches in the city to come and sing together. And watching, watching God do something as barren and alive churches come together to sing Life gets birthed in that place. And, and uh, I really believe God's going to break barrenness off the church and the place of worship. But here's, here's, here's the whole point I want to get to. You guys doing all right? I'll be really quick. David, at that night, he goes to bed, and there's a man by the name of, of Nathan who was assigned out of the school of prophets and prophet Samuel. He was assigned to, to the king to hear the voice of the Lord and to lead him with prophetic wisdom. And David is laying there, and imagine David's like, ah, 100 years, and now we have it back, and this is what I've gone to war for, and he's just like celebrating this moment. And, and he goes, and he just says, Nathan, ah, how is it that I am laying here in the house of cedar, but God is outside in the tent? And Nathaniel in this moment is so struck, and he goes, I actually don't have an answer for you. And he goes, but I do know this. God is with you. Do what's in your heart, David. Do what's in your heart, David, because God is with you. And Nathan leaves, and as he leaves, he hears the word of the Lord, and he says, go back, and I want you to tell him this. And I want you to look at this. This is what Nathaniel goes back and tells David. <clears throat> look at this in a second. Oh, I just... Well, 
Well, excuse me for a second. I closed my Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 6. Read this real quick. <clears throat> this is what he says. In, he says, go and tell my servant David, verse 5 of chapter 7. He says, thus says the Lord, would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelled in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Where have I moved about all the children of Israel? Have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, saying, whom I've commanded the shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built a house of cedar for me? But now, therefore, this is what you should say to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler of my people over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they would dwell in their own and move no more. Verse 11. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people of Israel, and have caused you to rest from all your enemies, and uh, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will, I will establish his kingdom and he will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever and I will be his father and he will be my son and if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him. But my mercy will, do not, will not depart from him as I took it from Saul and your house and your kingdom will be established forever before you, and your throne will be established forever. And here's what the Lord is saying to David. He says, David, I've never asked for a house. But you want to build me one? David, everyone before you has just been obedient to my command. But David, you are looking into a desire of my heart that I didn't even ask for. David, you're a man after my own heart. David, you are a man that knows my heart. You're not just a good man that obeys my commands. You are, you are a son that knows me. David, I love your heart. David, here's what I'm gonna do. David, because you're a man after my own heart, I want, I want my son to be called your son. I want Jesus to be known as the son of David. Yeah. But God, I'll kill a man. God, I'll, I'll, I'm going to rebel against you and take a census and bring a plague. And God, I'm going to have an affair. David, you're a man after my heart. I want my son to be called the son of David. I, I want every child of mine that will come into Union with my heart through the life of Jesus. I want them to be David. I want this to be, I desire for you to be the model of, of an end times people that I'll call my sons and daughters. And he makes covenant with David. And then this prophetic word comes on and says, and in that day I will raise up the tent of David and it will bring about the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. And in and, 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 and this promise, and this covenant, where, where are we in this last day's move of God? So I believe that we're coming into understanding of the revelation of the Davidic heart that God has placed inside of humanity, that, that there is a divine order in the life of David that Jesus even commanded when he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. When he was giving that, he was giving the divine order and perfect theology of the life of a believer. He, he, was, give, he was giving the divine order that we would be kings and priests who would rule and reign upon the earth that we would first love the Lord with all our heart, with all of our soul, like a priest before God, and we would love our neighbor and be a king and rule over the nations of the earth. When Jesus gave that commandment, he was giving a Davidic model. When you look into Revelation chapter 5, there's this amazing moment in the prophetic revelation of the end times where, where there, there's an angel that is holding, are you guys okay? There's an angel that's holding the, the, um, this scroll that's got seven seals on the scroll, and, and in Roman culture, a, a scroll with seven seals was the, was the last will and testament of a person. It had seven seals on it. 
And John is looking, he sees an angel holding a, 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 an inheritance in his hand. And the, and, the, and the law in Roman culture was that it could not be opened or looked at, and the inheritance could not be given until the one that, it was, that wrote it died, and the person it was written to was present. And John looks at the scroll and he goes, oh my God, I know what that is. Can we open it? Who, who, who is it written to? I have to look in the scroll. What does it say? Who is it for? Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Who is worthy? Is, it, is the one that's written to? Is he here? Is he here now? I have to know. And the angel goes, don't, hold on. He's here. It's the line of the tribe of Judah. He's overcome, right? And in and, and the line of the tribe of Judah becomes present and the scroll comes out to be open and the angels begin to sing a song. And what they sing, they say, you are worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals for you are slain, but you are now alive again. And it says, and you have, you have made us kings and priests and we will rule and reign over the earth. The song of the inheritance of sons and daughters is, you are kings and you are priests and you will rule and you will reign upon the earth. And then you guys know the scrolls start to get cracked open. Plague comes out. <laughs> Do you guys realize that plague and famine and destruction, that those are not the inheritance? The inheritance is plague and famine will come, but you will be kings and priests in the midst of it. The inheritance is your identity that you will stand in the midst of trials and, 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 and in the midst of difficulty and there will be a bride, there will be a Davidic people that will stand as kings and will stand as priests and they will rule and reign in the midst of it. It says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, after Solomon built the temple, the Lord visited him. He says, because you built for me a house of sacrifice, when I send pestilence, when I send famine, when destruction comes on the land, if my people humble themselves and pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal the land. He literally says, this stuff's coming, but because you built this place and you're a priest before me, I'll give you authority over it. You can turn the tide of a nation. Do you, got, do you, got, are you guys, do you understand the, the, the ultimate authority and dominion that's given to a people that have a heart like David? bring their guitars to the front lines of ISIS, and sing to the Lord. We, we might think that that's silly, that some people go to Hippie Hill in San Francisco with some guitars and sing to the Lord, but people begin to run begging to get saved. That there's, there's a Davidic partnership with inside of you that when you love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and then the second comes in as a partner to the first thing, to love your neighbor, that it, it says upon this is founded all the law and the prophets. There is a divine order in that, that within that divine order attracts a divine influence. And within that divine influence, when we prioritize his presence with opportunity to love on people, it will present a moment in time in history um, where, where we will have entire dominion over everything that's happening all around us in our sphere of society. We have a, this is a very fresh testimony. I could go on and on about testimonies. Right now, our teams are like, we're going in and loving on pagans in places. We, right now, um, I, I, I struck up a friendship with the president of the Pagan Federation in the United Kingdom. And um, he, he's overseeing all of the pagan organizations over all of Europe. And um, I asked him if I could come and if I could, if I could worship Jesus and love on his witches at one of his, the largest witch festival in the world in London. And, uh, and they said no, but we went anyways. <laughs> and uh, we bought our plane tickets. We said, whoops, we bought our plane tickets. We're coming. And, and um, so we got there. And, uh, and in London, and there's a hurricane called Abigail, and we put a tent outside of the conference center, a tent in a hurricane, kind of crazy, right? We got our jackets on, and we just started inviting people in to, um, we call them spiritual readings, what they are, prophetic words, and we invite witches in, we're using their language, and we invite them in for a spiritual reading, and our team sit down, 
while they're sitting there, we have a team of people in a room that have been worshiping Jesus, not contending against witchcraft. Worshiping Jesus. Yeah, I found that the best way to throw down a principality and power is to build a bigger one. And so he's enthroned upon the praise of Israel. I find that there's no place of authority and dominion I can't get from the place of worship. And so we go in and we don't get distracted with warfare. We get in and, and we worship Jesus, the only one worthy of our attention. I love what Bill Johnson says. I only look at the enemy long enough to point and shoot. And, um, and, uh, I, and so we go in, we have a team worshiping while this team's in a tent and all of a sudden, you know, pagans and witches are coming in and they're, and they're weeping and crying. These guys are getting accurate prophetic words over them. No one's being saved, but, you know, but we're really having awesome experiences with them. And, um, and, uh, and as we're sitting there, we're ministering to him. This guy comes up to me and he goes, this is about a couple hours in. He goes, are you Jamie Dixon? I said, yeah. <laughs> and he goes, my name's so-and-so. Uh, I'm the president of the Pagan Federation of the United Kingdom. I said, oh, great, nice to meet you. Uh, thanks so much for letting us come, you know. And, and uh, <laughs> he, um, he goes, we weren't really sure who you were because you guys were doing things a little different than most Christians do around here. And, uh, and he said, uh, and, and uh, so I've been sending spies, our best warlocks, our, our best psychics. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's why we've been so busy. And he goes, Yes, usually no one would come because you guys are obviously Christians. I said, how could you tell? We're not trying to hide it, but we're, you know, we're not like Bible thumping out here. He's like, you're at a pagan festival and you guys are wearing skinny jeans and North Face jackets. <laughs> He's like, you're obviously Christians. And so I said, you know, point taken. And, uh, and, he, goes, uh, and he goes, but here's, here's the report. He said, all these guys have been coming back to us. And, and he says, um, well, they've been reporting that you guys are scary accurate and they don't really know how you're getting the information that you're given. He goes, but more importantly, the best report that's come back is that you guys are really nice and uh, I want to come out here and thank you for being kind to my friends. And uh, he says, uh, he goes, we've never had anybody come in and just love on us here and I wanted to commend you. You guys are revealing Jesus very well to the witches. That's what he said, exact words. It was just crazy, right? And so, and so then a big gust of wind came, right? And started picking up our tent and people were being ministered to and our team leaders were like holding down the edges of the tent. Their like chairs are coming up off the ground and they're still prophesying, you know? And, and the, this guy, um, Mike, he runs to the edge of the tent, holds it down and goes, keep them coming, and like stood there for like 15 minutes holding the tent down so we could prophesy over people and share the gospel with them. Afterwards, he said, he said, you guys are, um, we would like you to come to anything that we do. We went back again this past year and witches were having open-eyed visitations with the angels that were assigned to our teams. Um, our leaders were invited to teach on prophesying and healing through Jesus at their conferences. Um, we now have a wide open door to every pagan event that they do. And the open door was that we loved them. And we had no agenda but to pour our love on them. And that, <clears throat> and that begins with us spending our time to love on Jesus first. And, um, and we, just, we just had another situation where we, um, we've had a, a married homosexual couple in our church for four years. And... Um, we have shared our stance on homosexuality with them. They absolutely know where we are. But I've also told them that I will forever be committed to your life. You guys um, confess to believe in Jesus and to know Jesus. And I do not agree with your lifestyle, but I love you. And I will, I will, you are always welcome inside of this church. And uh, I lost elders over it. And I said, listen, guys, we're going to keep leading to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will convict our sins. I've told them. I've, I've had these conversations. I've cried with them. I've wept with them. But they are not turning from their ways, so I'm going to stay committed to them. And uh, I will, in my lifetime, see them turn from their life because I was faithful to love them. Five years, I lost people in our church. I lost elders. I came under warfare attack. I had every single person telling me, kick them out. They're going to hold your church back. People give me scriptures, commit them to Satan, all kinds of stuff. And I said, no, that doesn't sit well with me. I'm going to be faithful and allow my love to penetrate their heart 
and I will see them. Two days ago, I got a phone call from one of them saying the Holy Spirit's touched her. She wants out of her lifestyle. She wants to walk through it. <clears throat> and uh, gosh, I could ball my eyes out. This has been such a long journey and believing and loving on them and being tested in my heart of what love looks like. I'm sharing this all to, to, to present to us that we've been called to be kings and priests, to rule and reign on the earth. And what does that look like? It looks like Matthew 22, to love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself. There is a first, there is a second, but the first and second are not separated. They're married together to bring divine order that would attract divine influence. And we will see the Lord do in these places of loving on him and loving on people, we will see the dominion that was promised in Amos 9-11 that will lead to the greatest harvest of souls the world has ever seen. And, and I want to end tonight. I'm sorry I've gone over my time. I get excited. I, but I want to I wanna pray over you tonight that, that your heart would get so set on fire for his presence. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I want to I wanna pray for you tonight that I know, I know for sure James Levesque will be here next week and he's gonna pray for the sick to be healed and gift of faith to be released. I wanna pray tonight. I believe that the very thing that will keep the greatest revival the world's ever seen pure is by keeping our hearts alive to the first thing, his presence, to being laid down lovers of Jesus and, and, and to prioritize his presence over all mission, over all dreams, over all mandates, over all callings, over all giftings, over all projects, that his presence would be first, that it would become the foundational cornerstone of our life, that we would become awakened and on fire with a Davidic heart to be a priest first and to be a king out of the place of priesting before God, that we would, that we would just come alive in this place and I want to lay hands on you if you feel like your heart's being stirred for this because I do believe those, those extended meetings really ignited something and catalyzed something in the region, but I believe something else is coming. And, and I, I, I believe it might not look like what we expect it to look like, but people are going to get absolutely messed up in love with Jesus. He will have his reward. He will have his reward, and he is longing for people to pour out their lives on him. We, we look at the story of Mary breaking the alabaster jar at the feet of Jesus, and he goes, this will be spoken for eternity concerning the gospel. I'm telling you, this will be the mark of an end times harvest. It will be not just people being on fire and signs and wonders. It will be marked by Mary's coming and breaking the alabaster jar at his feet because the gospel has made them alive, and they are in love with Jesus. They are madly in love with you. We're getting ready to see the most extravagant measures of worship and song and devotion to the Lord that we have ever seen. This will be the mark of revival. Come on, why don't you stand with me? There will be signs and there will be wonders for a people that walk in total dominion, but these will not be the consuming the consuming conversations of the church. It's going to be, oh, isn't he beautiful? That I'm telling you, the conversations will be, I just want more in my house. I just want more when I wake up. The conversations of this last time, end move of God will people be getting saved and going, is there more? I must have more of him. It says in Ezekiel, 43 it says now concerning the levites the priests of david it says now about these ones let's talk about their inheritance don't give them gold don't give them land don't give them precious stones i am their inheritance i am their inheritance not revival not meetings in ministry i am their inheritance uh, and there's some moms and dads in the room you've been crying out for your kids I'm telling you get lost in the face of Jesus and he'll be a father to the fatherless and defender of widows there, there's some people in the room break, breaking this down practically there's some people in the room 
that you've been so overcome with the things you've been contending for, the things you've been fighting for, the things you've been longing for, that it's become the, it's become the affection of your life to pray for the need. I'm telling you, the Lord is calling you even a sabbatical away from contending and into worshiping and falling in love with Him. And you'll find that He's going to fight battles that you weren't able to get victory in. You're going to see breakthrough in this place. But He's calling you back He's calling you back into that place. And so if, if you're just if you're just feeling like, God, I need my heart reignited. I want to be a priest. Put the linen ephod on me. Why don't you come up?